thank you very much for the yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm just gonna time myself to make sure that I don't run like over time. Uh, so as Ali said, I'm a research fellow working with it's Amigba, uh, DBI, but also at the Sanger Institute. Um, so let's just get started with this. Um, as many of you know, so the Monas aeruginosa is one of the escape pathogens. And this is largely due to the very broad arsenal of antibiotic resistant factors encoded in its genome. But unlike many other pathogens, the contributions of plasmids to the Pseudomonas aeruginosa resistom has been historically underestimated, to say the least. Uh, plasmids are mostly associated in Pseudomonas aeruginosa with extended spectrum beta lactamases and mostly associated with a few number of small plasmids. But Pseudomonas aeruginosa, along with many other pathogens, are responsible for the global crisis of antimicrobial resistance. But something that is quite important to remember is that this problem is actually uneven because there are some countries that are more affected than others. And one of these countries is Thailand, where back in 2012, around 32, sorry, 38,000 uh, deaths caused by antimicrobial resistant infections were already recorded per year. And it's in this context where we uh, start, started our study uh, tracking the origin of resistant infections caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa in a clinical environment. This environment is the Ramati Body Hospital, part of the Maidol University, located in Bangkok, and is one of the largest in the region. Well, back in 2013, there were several reports of a variety of Pseudomonas aeruginosa resistant infections circulating in the hospital. So we decided to use genomics to investigate to investigate the drivers of such resistance. So we sampled the hospital and we gathered a set of clinical isolates displaying different levels of antibiotic resistance. We sequenced them all using Illumina, but something we did different is that those isolates displaying the highest level of resistance to multiple antibiotics, we also sequenced them using PacBio. So combining long and short read sequencing data, we were able to complete the genome of the multidrug resistant uh, strains. And in doing so, we discovered these very large plasmids, about 400 KB, that we refer to as megaplasmids, that are quite remarkable, not only because of their size, but because they carry dozens of antibiotic resistant genes located in very complex and dynamic regions featuring uh, large duplications and rearrangements. In one of the plasmids, we actually found a complete efflux pump. And it's important to mention, Copla places these megaplasmids as uh, or within the PTU PSE13. And so because these plasmids or megaplasmids were associated with the most resistant isolates in the hospital, we wondered whether we could find them somewhere else. And the answer was uh, yes, we found other 13 cases in databases, mostly associated with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but also in three other Pseudomonas species, which are very important to our study. I'm gonna mention a bit of this uh, afterwards. Well, when we compare the genomes of these megaplasmids, we define a core component of their genomes in, in which functions mostly related to the biology of the plasmid could be detected, and I mean, that was expected, but we also identify a very open pan genome and reach in many different adaptive traits. Uh, here on the slide on the right side, I'm just listing some resistant to antibiotics, uh, re metals, um, but also some disinfectant compounds and not only resistant, but also integration, transposition and even metabolism or plant derived compounds. So they are very diverse. Their pan genome is quite open still with 15 members. Well, due to the focus of our study, we were quite interested on the diversity of antibiotic resistant genes we could find. And when we look in detail into this diversity, we found that only 15 megaplasmids carry 56 uh, AMR genes that are resistant uh, against antibiotics of at least nine different classes. This is quite a scary picture if you're thinking of these megaplasmids circulating in a clinical environment. And when we look at the distribution, so the pattern of the distributions of the different genes amongst all the plasmids, we found very interesting patterns. For instance, 
here on the left side, the, the profile puts together all of these megaplasmids that come uh, geographically from the same place and they were reported by the same group. And as we can see, their profile of resistant genes is quite similar. And the same story goes for the two megaplasmids that we identify in the hospital in Thailand. So this implies that the acquisition of the resistant factor was local. And something equally relevant is that the only two megaplasmids that we got or we identified in natural environments carry no antibiotic resistant genes. Instead, the regions uh, where the AMR genes are, so, are usually encoded are replaced for other metabolic pathways that are relevant to that particular niche where these plasmids were isolated from. Well, previously we used now the complete sequences as a reference, trying to identify more plasmids in Illumina data that we got from the hospital. And because that strategy was successful, then we decided to apply it to a larger, uh, broader scale and pretty much go fishing for these megaplasmids in the databases. So back then we used all the pseudomonas genomes that were available, not only aeruginosa, because we have found some megaplasmids in different non-aeruginosa species. And that number uh, was around 5,000 genomes. And when we analyzed them and we used the reference, we actually identified other 71 megaplasmids that have been there for decades overlooked. Quite interestingly, some of these were already reported. So they were part of publications where the authors mentioned they didn't find a signature of any plasmid content in pseudomonas, which is widely accepted. It pretty much is thought that pseudomonas are you know, really don't like, sorry, doesn't like plasmids. But analyzing these new, new overlooked uh, megaplasmids, we identify this very broad uh, distribution, not only geographically, but also temporal, because one of the all the isolates are from 1970. And then obviously we identify the megaplasmids in multiple species and in broad isolation sources. So we had pretty much the column of clinical uh, environments, any kind of infections, but also natural environments. It goes everywhere from sewage, soil, and even bioreactors. So these megaplasmids are really very widely distributed in the environment. And they seem to hint a link between an environmental reservoir and how those can invade a clinical environment and start spreading quite successfully. Because these megaplasmids are large, one may assume, and we would be correct to do so, that they, they represent a burden to their host. And that's what we investigated, uh, the fitness cost of carrying one of these big plasmids and how frequently they could transfer into other plasmids. So we did this, um, all credits to uh, James Hall. Jamie did these experiments uh, with us. Um, so the fitness we measure via competition assays. First, we transfer the megaplasmid from one of the environmental isolates, the Pseudomonas corensis, and one of the uh, clinical isolates, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So one megaplasmid carry no AMR genes and the other one does. And we transfer those to Pseudomonas fluorescence. And it was in this model that I know very well, as you heard yesterday. Uh, it was in this model when we, where we did the competition assays. So pretty much the summary of the, the results is that we really didn't find uh, a, a significant difference between the fitness of the control strain with no plasmids and that one carrying the megaplasmid from natural environment. Quite interestingly, the one that carries the AMR megaplasmid seems to have uh, the slightly better uh, fitness. And this is compared to something very well known, the other two uh, very big plasmids that uh, Mike and Jamie talked about yesterday, which we know represent a fitness cost. And then when we look at the frequency uh, of uh, conjugation between these megaplasmids and their new recipient, the frequency for both megaplasmids are actually, is actually quite high. And we take as reference, again, the other PQR, sorry, PQBR plasmids that Jamie and Mike have been studying for, for many years now. So summary, these megaplasmids um, that we call PBT24 light are involved in the dissemination of AMR genes against multiple antibiotics in classes in clinical environments. They are flexible and dynamic because the pan genome, as I mentioned, is open and highly flexible. So they feature the acquisition of a complex, a, sorry, it features a complex gene acquisition patterns and interactions with other mobile elements. 
It has been neglected uh, for decades, um, despite having a global distribution and being associated with very diverse isolation sources. Uh, but they seem to be very efficient because at least in our experimental conditions, uh, this seems to be stable in non-selective conditions and they transfer readily to other pseudomonas. They's not, they seem uh, to pose no fitness cost uh, to their host. And something that I was really intrigued by back then uh, for two main different reasons is how can we broaden our view of the megaplasmids evolution? And this is in part because I got some emails from other uh, 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 researchers saying, you know, I found a plasmid that is quite large, that is in pseudomonas. I read your paper, but we haven't seen, uh, uh, we haven't found a match with the one that you are reporting. So I knew there were other megaplasmids that were pretty much being discovered and they weren't similar to ours. So I asked myself that, the same question, how can we broaden our, our perspective of the evolution? And I, I believe it's all about surveillance, but I would argue is about plasmid oriented surveillance rather than only looking for whatever is resistant because resistant is quite dynamic, it can be transitory, right? So not long ago, we published this paper with Jamie again and other uh, co-authors um, on what makes a megaplasmid. And so if you're interested on how we think you can define what a megaplasmid is, we invite you to read this paper. But what I want to point out here is that we present this plot uh, that shows the percentage of publications on plasmids that contain the term megaplasmid. So as you can see, it's becoming popular in the last uh, few years. And that usually comes along with more sequences. And that is good for us because we can analyze the sequence space in a, in a deeper way. And in Pseudomonas aeruginosa in particular, this, this plot uh, represents the plasmid distribution that is different depending on the, on the family and uh, taxonomically. And in Pseudomonadacea, this, this component that is the large plasmid is starting to increase in the last few years. And so what I did now is kind of update on analysis. And it was quite shocking for me that not even two years after our publication and the last time that, I, that we checked in our analysis, we found now many more of these megaplasmids that are complete. And something we did different this time is that we were more relaxed uh, uh, regarding the threshold that we would use to identify similarity between these plasmids. So now we were looking for anything that was uh, similar to at least 10% coverage. So this is very, very low. Um, what we found now is that the number of complete megaplasmids has more than quadrupled in less than two years. And this network of similarity represents how they are related to each other. So there's a still diversity. Here, uh, I mark the names of the kind of reference megaplasmid that we've known for some time. So as you can see, there are uh, different clusters in this similarity network. But something that is quite shocking is these plasmids are colored here by the number of AM margins they contain. And altogether, these megaplasmids in the network encode a 571 AMR margins, and 56 was the number of our previous record. So at least eight of the species are present in this network. So the monas uh, fulva, nitroducens, syringae are newly reported as megaplasmid carries. So we didn't see this before. And in terms of where they are coming from, blood, urine, and feces of a migratory bear also feature among the isolates that we haven't seen before. Sorry, the isolation sources we haven't seen before. The, the replicon times are very complicated because they feature uh, multiple of them, but at least five different ones. And nearly 70% of these plasmids, and I think that's very important, are predicted by different programs to be non-mobilizable, despite we know they can move and they can conjugate because of our experiments. So it's kind of a cautionary tale on how to read uh, the different predictions. In the end, they are predictions and they, they remain to be tested. So one remaining question here is because we set our threshold of similarity very low, we might just be catching things randomly and they are actually not related to each other. So we wonder whether the only thing in common in the plasmids that are present in this network is that they are actually big because don't let this small guy fool you, this that the smallest is 168 KB and now the largest is 636 KB. So we knew from this network that many of these are not gonna be similar at the nucleotide level to other plasmids. 
because we don't see those connections in the network. So what we did now was going one step beyond and start comparing at the level of protein. So what you can see here is just a comparison of kind of representative of different clusters in the network and how similar they are to each other. But this is at amino acid level. So as you can see, there are some regions mostly related with uh, transference, conjugation, um, and, uh, and other variety of functions that actually are conserved, but to the level of protein. So you can't see those similarities to the level of nucleotide, but there's something in common beyond being large. And I just want to finish this talk by saying, um, this is the picture when you take only one megaplasmid reference. So you can see here, their sizes are very large. But what if, if we start looking at the pan genome of a megaplasmid superfamily, so it connects those plasmids that are very large, that can also be connected by homology, but despite divergence. And then you put them all together and then you make a, a pan genome of those. Well, the result is they also share very complex patterns of sequence similarity. And now the pan genome of this megaplasmid goes above uh, one megabase, 1.8 megabases. So it's quite similar to the size of a small, a small bacteria chromosome. So with that, I just want to finish and, and thank uh, everyone involved and my current supervisors for letting me pursue in this and, and also for your time and the organizers for having me. Thank you very much. Happy to have any questions. Wow, interesting talk. I, I, was, I wanted to ask you, is there more to them? Is, are they just classes? But you ask yourself the question and you answer, so. <laughs> I let's check if somebody has hands on. No, in the chat. Uh, no, no. I think everyone is ready for a break. I think everybody. <laughs> is. So I just have an announcement on the Rowan Meta mystery. Uh, he was late because he had something at noon, so he couldn't make it. And he will be speaking at 6.30 uh, Rome time after our last speaker, hopefully, uh, let's see. So that's all. <laughs>